Hi, it's Rob Bryanson, and uh, this is my video blog entry for November 12th, 2007. Uh, today's entry uh, is called How to Make a Universe, and uh, this is uh, one that we're going to be playing uh, uh, that has as its background uh, something you'll be able to find on YouTube if you type in uh, Mandelbrot, M-A-N-D-E-L-B-R-O-T. Uh, this uh, animation is called A Mandelbrot the Size of the Known Universe. Uh, this is a fractal math set, uh, fractals being things that when you can zoom in on them, uh, you keep finding more and more detail. Uh, there are a lot of things in nature that are, are this way as well. Uh, coastlines is a, a common example, for instance, that when you uh, look at the, the uh, coastline, you can keep zooming in and, and uh, go through bays and down into tiny little indentations along the the coast and right down to uh, deeper and deeper levels of magnification and keep seeing the, the same kinds of patterns repeating over and over. So if uh, the animation that we're looking at right now, where we're starting from uh, we can imagine is the size of the known universe. We're going to keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. By the time it gets to the end, it takes about three minutes, uh, you're at just the size of your computer screen. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a mind blower to watch and uh, hopefully it won't be too distracting to have uh, this as my background today but uh, it does kind of fit in with the concept of what we're going to be reading which is uh, this blog entry called How to Make a Universe. So here it goes. We start with the unobserved quantum wave function. This is where, as quantum physics, physicists say, information and reality are equivalent. Although quantum physics has no specific requirement for there to be ten spatial dimensions in order for us to imagine this unobserved state, what we're talking about here is the multiverse, the timeless place where the potential for all possible and impossible universes is exists. Sorry, where the potential for all possible and impossible universes exists simultaneously. Now we make our first observation. Quantum computing expert Seth Lloyd in his book Programming the Universe, suggests that we can think of the Big Bang as the very first yes-no. And that's what we're thinking about here. Out of all potential expressions of reality contained within the timeless multiverse, we place the very first point which begins the creation of a universe. Physicists tell us that the only force that exists across all dimensions is gravity. So one of the things that we are likely to have already done with that very first yes-no point of entry is to choose a value, or at least a range of values, for what gravity is going to be in the universe we are planning to make. Let's call that first point the beginning of time. With our first point, we are narrowing down what the force of gravity can be for the universe we want to create. But before we can define a second point, we need to choose a value for the speed of light. No matter what dimension we're thinking about, or how many dimensions we're imagining, time is the way that we change from one state to the next. But time is not a continuous line, it's actually a series of points, one after the other. For our own universe, those points are each one Planck length away from the next. So much the same as a movie is made up of frames that are being shown at a certain number of frames per second, we know that our universe is also being observed at a certain number of frames per second, and in quantum physics, those frames are called quanta. The length of time between those frames is entwined with the specific speed of light for our universe. And the idea that our universe is being created one frame at a time at the speed of light gives us a way to explain why it's impossible to exceed the speed of light within our universe. This also explains why it's impossible to observe anything smaller than the Planck length which is about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. Attempting to do so puts us back to where we started, between those frames of time, and back into indeterminacy in the timeless multiverse. Back in 1919, Kaluza sent a startling proof to Einstein, stating that the field equations for gravity and light can be resolved if they're calculated in the fifth dimension. Einstein ruminated on this idea for two years, then gave it his full endorsement. Here's what this tells us about our own universe then. It is being defined at the fifth dimension by the specific values it has for the strength of gravity and the speed of light. What if we wanted to create some other universe that had a different value for gravity and the speed of light? We would back all the way out to the indeterminate quantum field, choose a different point of entry, and choose a different frame rate 
or some other universe to be observed. We could even try making a universe that had gradually changing or oscillating values for gravity and the speed of light, although most of those universes would not be nearly as stable as the one we live in. There could be other values that are also being determined by our point of entry, but just how many of the finely tuned constants that create any specific universe and its specific distribution of matter are a result of nothing more than the push and pull between the strength of gravity and the speed of light, and how many of those other constants are not related to those two ba basic values, is a debate better left to the experts. Still, this leads us to an important question. How did we get so lucky? as to be on a universe specifically tuned to create, to create life as we know it. String theory is sometimes criticized because it can be used to explain not just the universe we live in, but 10 to the power of 500 other universes as well, each with their own collection of particles and forces. But if all those other possible universes we're imagining really do exist out there in the multiverse, just as real as the one we're living in, then there are no doubt organized collections of information or expressions of matter in some of those other universes that are asking themselves the very same questions. In any particular universe, we can imagine life as being the stuff that becomes interested in what happens next as their universe is moving along its own line of time, being created one quantum frame after another. And that leaves us with a very open definition of life that works well for our own universe but allows us to imagine a great many other things that could also be called life in those other universes. In September 2007, a team of scientists at Oxford University, under the leadership of physicist David Deutsch, published a proof equating the bush-like branching structure of possible quantum states with the branching choices that each of us within our own physical universe are making as we move through time. This means that whether we realize it or not, at both the quantum level of frames that are one plank length away from each other, and out here in our physical reality, the actions of chance, choice, and circumstance are moving us down what we think of as a fourth dimensional line of time. But curled up down at the plank length, we are actually twisting and turning through the available paths that the Deutsch team have proved really do exist. Imagining that there are parallel universes where each of us make decisions that are different from the ones we make in this one is the outcome of that proof that some physicists are simply not comfortable with. But it's an implication that I've been promoting since I first came up with this way of imagining the dimensions 20 years ago. In my book, Imagine the Tenth Dimension, I've suggested a way to blend the concepts of the multiverse, quantum indeterminacy, Kaluza's idea that we're in the fifth dimension, and the M-theory idea that our reality comes from 10 spatial dimensions plus one of time. Mainstream physics tends to keep those ideas separate from each other, so my idea of mashing them up into one big concept is not what you'd be taught in a university physics class. That's why I call my book Imagining the Tenth Dimension, subtitle it A New Way of Thinking About Time and Space, and say in promotion for the book that it's not about mainstream physics. What I do say about my new way of thinking, though, is that it is a mind-expanding journey that could change the way you view this incredible universe in which we live. And a great many people around the world seem to agree. The Tenth Dimension website, launched in July 2006, continues to grow in popularity and at the end of 2007 is now averaging 2 million hits a month. Let there be light. It's fun to think about all the possible universes that started from a point in the void, then defined a value for the speed of light and that's what caused those universes to spring into existence. While it's true that the echoes of those ideas in ancient philosophy and spirituality may be coincidence, I believe this is showing us that human beings have intuitively believed basic truths about the nature of reality long before modern science was able to demonstrate their inner workings. This is why my book deals with so many out there topics that most scientists are not comfortable with but the general public are more willing to embrace. This includes ideas about consciousness and spirit, memes and creativity, conspiracies and the end of the world and so on. Since I'm a composer, not a physicist, I also have 26 songs about the nature of reality attached to this project, most of which are now available as videos on YouTube and Rever.com. By the time you have this way of imagining the dimensions in mind, you have a way to see how everything fits together within the timeless multiverse. People who have worked through this set of ideas most commonly call it mind-blowing, which is flattering. 
For those purists who dislike any blending of disciplines outside your own area of interest, I appreciate your criticism, but that's not what we're pursuing here. And despite the best efforts of those critics, my 10th dimension meme that was set in motion in the summer of 2006 is continuing to grow as a result of the increasingly connected world that we live in. No matter what universe we imagine ourselves making, it has the potential to be expressed in unique ways from the 10th dimension down to the 1st, with a point moving through it that we can think of as time or the quantum observer. So let's work through the hierarchy of dimensions as I've portrayed them now, this time moving from the top down as opposed to the bottom up uh, as it is in the 10th uh, dimension animation that uh, has ultimately uh, been what has driven a lot of people to this project. So we'll start at 10. 10 is the timeless multiverse, quantum indeterminacy, the unobserved quantum information that is potentially energy and mass. Nine is big picture memes, ways of organizing or grouping or subdividing the information, including those which cannot be expressed as physical realities. Eight is ways of expressing mass and energy that encompass multiple fine structure constants. And uh, I've, as I mentioned uh, previously, some of those would not be stable. In fact, most of those probably would not be stable. But, uh, you know, if you were interested in creating uh, universes that destroy themselves, if, the, if you were uh, like a three-year-old who likes to build a tower of blocks and kick them over, then that would be a good place to create a universe. Seven is ways of expressing mass, energy, that encompass only one sliding variable. The seventh dimension as a line or ways of expressing mass energy where all fine structure constants fine structure constants are locked in which would be the seventh dimension as a point with our universe being one example when we say that our universe is locked in at the seventh dimension then one of the ideas that are unique to this way of imagining the dimensions we're also saying that it is locked in from the seventh dimension all the way up to the tenth the fact that string theory says our universe is created by the interaction of a seven-dimensional brain interacting with a three-dimensional brain within a, within a Calibre -Yao, Yao manifold is probably just a coincidence, but an entertaining sidebar to this discussion. Six is all possible timelines for the universe we have created, including ones that may never actually be observed, but which remain as potential. Five is all branching timelines, both forward and backward, from the particular point that we call now. Thinking back to how we created our universe, the branches from the very first point then would be the same in both the fifth and sixth dimension. But for every other quantum frame, the fifth dimension would not be able to include every possible expression contained within the sixth because of the limitations introduced by choices that had already occurred. Four is one very specific set of frames from the Big Bang to now. Or in the biggest picture of all, one very specific timeline out of all the possible timelines from the beginning to the end of the universe we created. Three is a, spe three is a specific expression of the 3D space that is a quantum frame as per our description above. Two is a specific expression of one of the 2D planes that can be contained within the quantum frame we're examining. One is a specific expression of one of the 1D lines that can be contained within the quantum frame we're examining. Zero is not a dimension, but a point of indeterminate size, which could be infinitely small, as in geometry, or could be infinitely large, encompassing, in the most extreme case, all of the dimensions. Some people like to think of the zero as time. Some like to call it the quantum observer. Some people like to think of it as being nothing more than the way that you move to a specific subset of the dimensions below the tenth. All of these, I believe, are different ways of expressing the same idea. Each, addition, each, each additional dimension adds a degree of freedom, and each additional dimension, I'm having trouble with that phrase, is only a subset of the remaining ones above it. So a 1D line can be drawn within any dimension. A 2D plane can be a slice out of the other dimensions but can't exist within the first. A 3D space can be part of the probability space of the 4D line of time and above, but can't be expressed in the first and second, and so on. The logical hierarchy of what is being examined here and imagined here is what keeps people wanting to explore these ideas. And for that, I'm very grateful. So uh, enjoy the journey. 
that's the end of the blog entry that uh, we're looking at today. And uh, this one uh, did rattle on for quite a while here, so I think I'm just going to wrap it up now with a song. And uh, as I said, there's 26 songs that are part of this project. Uh, we've created a variety of different videos for them, and we're still working on more. Uh, we're also uh, working, uh, Ron Scott, who you've seen on some of these shows, uh, has created new recordings of some of the uh, uh, songs, uh, and uh, he's actually a better singer than I am, so uh, you, you, I hope you'll enjoy some of those. We're working on videos for those songs as well now. Uh, the song we're going to finish is uh, called From the Corner of My Eye, and it's uh, based on the suggestion that there could be Right now, even as we're traveling down our, what we think is a 4D line of time, uh, twisting and turning in the fifth dimension, creating our reality from the probability space that exists there, there could be ways that our senses are sensing uh, those other dimensions that are above us, and that's a whole discussion unto itself. But uh, this song uh, uh, takes those ideas and turns it into a set of lyrics from the corner of my eye. Thanks for watching. This is Rob Bryanton. From the corner of my eye, I saw it. Thought I caught a glimpse at the edge of sight. Just a tiny inkling, very hard to see. A flutter like a thousand wings in flight. In the corner of my mind, I questioned how could there be more? Then this world of ours, just a trick of vision, disorder of the mind, a pattern of tiny twirling stars. At the corner of my eye, at the corner of my eye, I saw the dance and spin of other worlds within. Such a mystery from the corner of my eye, hidden in the folds. Those other worlds untold How can it be In the corner of my heart I felt it There's so many worlds That we cannot see Just around a corner Hard for us to turn Angels dancing endlessly at the corner of my eye, at the corner of my eye, I saw the dance and spin of other worlds within. Such a mystery from the corner of my eye, hidden in the folds, those other worlds untold.